Soren Kierkegaard, Either Or. Either Or is more like a novel than a philosophical treatise, and like most novels, it's resistant to paraphrase. Nevertheless, its central concern is clear. It's the question asked by Aristotle, how should we live? Kierkegaard's answer to this question is oblique enough to leave a trail of contradictory and sometimes confusing interpretations in its wake. On the surface, at least, it explores two fundamentally different ways of life, the aesthetic and the ethical, but it does this from within. The views aren't summarised, but rather expressed by two characters who are the fictional authors of the work. Kierkegaard's writing has a playful quality. One aspect of this is his use of pseudonymous authorship. It's not just that Kierkegaard writes under a series of pseudonyms. Rather, he creates fictional characters, different from his own, in whose voices he writes. The tone of either or is set in the preface. The narrator, who is called Victor Eremita, tells the story of how he came by the manuscripts, which are published as either or. He had bought a second-hand writing desk, an escritoire, which he had long admired in a shop window. One day, just as he was leaving for a holiday, a drawer of the desk jammed. In despair, he kicked the desk. A secret panel sprang open, revealing a hoard of papers. These, which appeared to be written by two people whom he labelled A and B, he put into order and published. It emerges that B is a judge called Wilhelm. We never actually learn the identity of A. This story is, of course, a fiction, and A and B are fictional characters. The story of the escritoire provides a metaphor for a central theme of the book, the discrepancy between appearances and reality, or as Kierkegaard usually puts it, the inner is not the outer. The technique of using pseudonymous authors allows Kierkegaard to distance himself from the views explored and expressed in the book and to hide his own position behind that of his characters. But it also allows him to get inside the various positions he evokes, to investigate them from the point of view of the inner life of imagined individuals rather than by means of the cool abstractions which philosophers typically employ. This is an aspect of Kierkegaard's method of indirect communication, a self-conscious attempt to convey truths about living human beings by showing aspects of their lives rather than describing abstract and impersonal concepts. Either. The first part of the book, called Either, is the part that is usually read. Most readers find that A's writing is more interesting and diverse than the solid, somewhat laborious section written by B. Very few of those who enjoy either bother to slog through every page of or, even in the abridged versions in which it usually appears. Nevertheless, parts of or provide a detailed, if biased, commentary on A's approach to life, the aesthetic approach, while defending B's own ethical approach. A's writing doesn't provide a direct description of his approach to life, rather it exemplifies it through its concerns and style of writing, the aesthetic approach to life. In simple terms, the aesthetic approach to life has at its heart the hedonistic pursuit of sensual pleasure. But this doesn't adequately characterise Kierkegaard's use of this term, since it suggests a brutish craving after physical satisfaction, whereas for Kierkegaard, the aesthetic approach includes the more refined pleasure-seeking of the intellectual aesthete. This aesthete's pleasures may come from the contemplation of beauty and the refined appreciation of works of art, or they may include delight in the sadistic exercise of power, an attitude revealed in the section of either called The Seducer's Diary. All these pleasures are sought by A. For Kierkegaard, the aesthetic approach to life involves a restless seeking after new pleasures, since the worst that can happen to someone who adopts this way of life is that they become bored. Boredom, for the aesthete, is the root of all evil. So A suggests a half-serious strategy for avoiding boredom, which he jokingly labels crop rotation. Crop rotation involves arbitrarily changing your attitude to life or to whatever you happen to be involved in. Like the method by which farmers replenish the soil's nutrients, the arbitrary shifting of viewpoint should replenish the individual and help stave off boredom. A's example is of having to listen to a boar. As soon as A started concentrating on the drops of sweat running down the boar's nose, the boar ceased to be boring. At this point, Kierkegaard seems to sow the seeds of surrealism in his celebration of the arbitrary and of perverse approaches to life. He suggests, for example, just going to the middle of a play or reading only the third part of a book 
thereby getting a new and potentially stimulating angle on what could otherwise be tedious. The restless shifting of topics and styles in the essays that make up either reflects this constant search for new stimulation characteristic of the aesthetic approach to life. This is most apparent in the opening section called Diepsalmata, Greek for refrains, which is a series of fragmentary comments and aphorisms. Other parts of either are presented as quasi-academic papers, or else, most notably, in one case, as a diary. The seducer's diary is a novella within either. It's a brilliantly written account of the cynical seduction of a young woman, Cordelia, incorporating, as the title suggests, a diary, but also letters from the woman to her seducer. It stands as a work of literature in its own right, but within either, it provides a case study of one way of living within the aesthetic approach, an attempt to live life poetically rather than ethically. In the preface to either or, Victor Eremita, the fictional editor of the whole work, introduces the diary, which he claims to have found amongst the papers in the desk. But there is a further level of concealment of authorship in that the diary itself has a preface, allegedly written by someone who knew the protagonists. Eremita draws attention to what he calls this Chinese box, suggesting that the diary's editor might well be a fiction used by the seducer to distance himself from what it describes. Of course, as readers of either or, we are immediately at a further level of remove from the events than was Eremita, well aware that Eremita is simply another mask worn by Kierkegaard, and that the events that the diary describes are almost certainly creations of the philosopher's imagination, rather than a description of something that actually happened. We might also take his account of this distancing technique to apply equally to Kierkegaard's own use of pseudonyms and puzzles of authorship throughout either or. Eremita describes A's attitude to the seducer's diary as possibly being like someone who scares himself as he recounts a frightening dream, suggesting that this might be why he has to hide behind the mask of an imagined editor. The seducer's aim is to get a particular young woman to fall in love with him. He succeeds in this and then withdraws all affection. His pleasure isn't a simple physical gratification, but a kind of psychological sadism. Seduction is the quintessential pastime of those who adopt the aesthetic approach to life, and it's significant that an earlier essay in either The Immediate Stages of the Erotic is devoted to an examination of Mozart's Don Giovanni, an opera which follows the fortunes of a serial seducer. For A, Don Giovanni is the supreme achievement of a great composer. The underlying suggestion is that A is drawn to this opera because in important ways the central character's lifestyle mirrors his own. The ethical approach to life. Whereas in either, the reader has to work hard to extract a sense of the view that the writing illustrates and exemplifies. In all, views are stated explicitly and mostly directed against aspects of A's lifestyle. The pseudonymous author of all, B, or Judge Wilhelm, not only sets out his own approach to life, but also criticises A's own. Thus, a far clearer picture of either's meaning emerges when you read or. In contrast to A's life spent in pursuit of pleasure, B advocates a life in which the individual chooses his or her actions. As B describes it, the life of the aesthete puts the individual at the whim of outside events and circumstances, since we can't simply choose the sources of our pleasure, but must rely on aspects of the world to stimulate us. The ethical approach, in contrast, is always motivated from within. It's not a matter of learning a set of rules and obeying them, but rather of transforming yourself into someone whose choices coincide with duty. From this point of view, the aesthete A is merely hiding behind a set of masks, shirking responsibility for his freedom. B believes that such an approach requires a kind of self-deception. The ethical approach requires self-knowledge. The point of adopting it is to transform yourself into what B calls the universal individual. That is, somehow to choose to become a model of humanity. This, B claims, reveals the true beauty of humanity in a way that the aesthetes' purported pursuit of beauty never can. Readings of either or. 
an existentialist interpretation. According to the existentialist interpretation of either or, the reader is faced with a radical choice between the two approaches to life. There are no guidelines which indicate how to choose. We must choose one or the other and thereby create ourselves through that choice. However, contrary to the views which dominated the Enlightenment, there is no such thing as a right answer to the question, how should I live? The reasons for choosing the ethical above the aesthetic only make sense if you are already committed to the ethical approach to life. To suggest that the aesthetic approach is evil is to imply that you've already accepted that there is a good evil distinction to be drawn. Similarly, the justifications for the aesthetic approach only appeal to the aesthete and would be ruled out as inconsequential by one committed to the ethical way of life. The pleasures of seduction, for example, would count for nothing in Judge Wilhelm's reckoning. On this reading, either or reflects the anguished position of all humanity. We find ourselves forced to choose, and through our choices we create what we are. That is the human condition. Existentialists have thus seen either or as a key text in the history of the existentialist movement. On this view, Kierkegaard was one of the first philosophers to recognise the importance of radical choice in the face of a world in which no preordained value can be discerned, thereby anticipating many of the themes which would occupy Jean-Paul Sartre a century later. It's certainly true that most 20th century existentialists have been influenced by Kierkegaard's writing. The case for the ethical. Whilst there is much in Kierkegaard's text which supports an existentialist reading, some interpreters have seen the book as a thinly veiled advocacy of the ethical above the aesthetic. B sees through A's aestheticism and presents him with a solid, if staid, alternative. Only through seizing control of your life and putting it beyond contingent events can you fulfil your nature. The aesthete is more or less at the whim of what happens. The ethical approach ensures that the self remains intact, even if chance events thwart your goals and desires. One point against this interpretation of either or is that it contradicts his claim that there is no didacticism in the book. A further objection is that so skilful a writer as Kierkegaard would not have presented his favoured approach to life in so dry and unpalatable a form. It's far from obvious why he would have given the aesthete A all the best lines and invented the staid and pontificating Judge Wilhelm as the defender of his favoured view. Thinly veiled autobiography. Kierkegaard met Regine Olsen when she was only 14. He was 21. Not unlike the seducer in the seducer's diary, he befriended her family and even her suitor. When Regine reached 17, Kierkegaard asked her to marry him and she accepted. However, Kierkegaard couldn't go through with the marriage and broke off the engagement in 1841, just two years before either or was published, leaving Regine humiliated and in great distress. Some commentators have seen parts of either or as a response to his situation, of more psychological than philosophical interest. On this reading, either presents the life of sensual pleasures that Kierkegaard had led in his youth and would have to relinquish if he married or, on the other hand, presents the case for marriage and the acceptance of social responsibilities that that entails. The book Either Or can thus be seen as a literary expression of the torment that led to the broken engagement. The philosophical surface is simply another screen, scarcely concealing the agonised soul in turmoil at the most significant choice he had to make in his life. This interpretation of Either Or may well be accurate, but it's entirely compatible with either of the two interpretations sketched already. It's interesting and informative to learn these biographical facts about the man Kierkegaard, but ultimately his writing stands or falls independently of its relation to his life and the psychological motivations which gave him the energy to write. Criticisms of either or. A false dichotomy. It's not obvious that the two ways of life exemplified by A and B cover all the options. There may be C, D, E, F and G to take into account. In other words, Kierkegaard seems to suggest that if you reject the aesthetic, the only option is the ethical and vice versa. However, this is a simplistic reading of Kierkegaard's position. 
Kierkegaard, or at least the character Victor Eremita, considers the possibility that one person has written a text of both either and or, suggesting that perhaps the two positions need not be as incompatible as they initially seem, and Kierkegaard need not be read as suggesting that these are the only two options available. Indeed, in subsequent writings he explicitly outlines a third approach, the religious attitude to life. Indeterminacy. It should be clear by now that either or is open to a wide range of interpretations and that Kierkegaard's original intentions are by no means easy to discern. It's a book which seems to have a profound message, yet critics aren't agreed about what that message is. Some say that this is because Kierkegaard is unacceptably indeterminate about what he means. This is a consequence of the style of writing he's chosen, with fictional characters exploring lived philosophical positions. Since characters exemplify rather than state their positions, there is some latitude for interpretation. Those who want simple views clearly stated in unambiguous prose are likely to be disappointed by Kierkegaard's more poetic approach to philosophy.